there's an old grave in New Hampshire. The victims that lay inside of it were victims in the Bear Brook case, found inside of barrels in the middle of the woods. Unable to identify the victims, they had to be buried anonymous, where the grave simply reads, Here lies the mortal remains known only to God of a woman, aged 23 through 33, and a child from age 8 to 10. Their slain bodies were found on November 10th of 1985 in Bear Brook State Park. May their souls find peace in God's loving care. There is no real answer as to why so many bad things happen. Sometimes I lie awake and think to myself, does evil really exist? Because even the nicest person can do the most evil things. What type of person do you have to be to do this without a shred of empathy or a glimmer of a conscience? People are buried alone for one thing, because they have no one by their side, no one to stand up for them, no one to fight for them. But even when there's no one there to fight for them, the blood of the innocent will cry out from the dirt itself and scream justice. Oh, sweet justice. Sweet, sweet justice. <laughs> There's an old town in the state of New Hampshire. It was founded in 1831. It's one of those small population towns where everyone knows everyone. It was once known for its beautiful scenery, the glistening water streams, wildlife, and even those precious granite stones that turn from the earth. This town that I speak of is called Allenstown, and right in the heart of Allenstown lies Bear Brooks State Park. Bear Brooks State Park, which is absolutely massive. It sits on over 10,000 acres worth of property and it's comprised of 40 miles worth of hiking trails. Like it's real big. There is a ton of the park that very rarely, if ever, gets traveled by humans. It's just thick, dense forest as far as the eye can see. And if you're not careful, you could very easily get lost out there. Bear Brooks State Park would become infamous for a tragedy that would occur. Not only would people lose their lives, but they would lose their very identity. They would go from being full of life to nothing more than a case number. Finding their identities wouldn't be easy, but the key would lie with one person. This is the story of the family man. The year was 1981. Denise Bolden was one of those young girls described as having a free spirit. I mean, this is after the 60s and the 70s. You know, the great hippie revolution. If you ask someone who grew up around that period, they would tell you that things were more relaxed back then. I've even heard people say that they used to sleep with their doors unlocked, that they felt undoubtedly safe. So being described as a free spirit back then is a lot different than they explain it today because today's side of that actually has more negatives than positive. Back then, you just had a free spirit, you loved life, you liked to take it how it came. Now, while many would describe Denise Bowden as a free spirit, her father Armand would say different. He would basically explain that she would just get into the wrong crowd of people, not exactly walking a straight arrow. The repercussions of her lifestyle would actually lead her to being 23 years old, and also a single mother. She was a mother of a six month old young girl. Her name was Dawn. But as fate would have it, Dawn Bowden wouldn't stay a single mother for long. Fate would have her cross paths with a man named Bob Evans. He was an electrician. He had recently moved back to Manchester. Bob Evans was a rolling stone. Being a skilled electrician, with that career you can basically pick up and move anywhere you want to. If your trade is in demand, you will always be needed. And that's exactly what Bob Evans did. He traveled, but we'll get to that later. After Denise Bowden and Bob Evans briefly dated, she decided that it was time for Bob to meet the family. In November of 1981, Bob would attend Thanksgiving dinner with Denise and her six month old daughter, Dawn. Denise's father, Armand, would actually explain the situation as nothing out of the ordinary. That is, until dinner time came. 
months. While at dinner, Bob began explaining to the family how, due to some bad debts they had, they'd actually be leaving the area soon, which, like, odd dinner conversation, but I mean, okay. Now keep in mind that this is Bob Evans' first time actually even meeting the family. So, you know, that's kind of out of place for him to be saying, well, by the way, I know I just met you, but I'm taking your daughter and I'm heading out of state. But nonetheless, Denise Bowden is grown. She has the right to choose what she wants to do. Well, less than a week later, he actually takes a drive from Golfstown. Yes, Armand lives in Golfstown. It's a short drive from Manchester. He takes the drive to see his daughter, and when he gets there... Okay. Sure enough, less than a week later, when Armand attempted to invite Denise to his house for Christmas, he discovered that they were already gone. And sadly, Armand would never see his daughter again. But because they'd informed him ahead of time that they were going to leave, he never filed a missing persons report. Denise Bowden and her six-month-old daughter, Dawn Bowden, would simply vanish. But not in the eyes of Armand, because as it said, he had already warned him that he was going out of town. So Armand just took it as, well, she went to live her life. She had driven off into the sunset with Bob Evans, the electrician who had stolen her heart. Bob was born on December 23rd of 1943. He had a regular upbringing, somewhat disciplined, because in 1961, he would enlist into the US Navy. But by 1967, he would be officially discharged. By the later 60s, around 1968, he would be living in Hawaii. There, he would marry his first wife. Things wouldn't work out, they would separate. By the late 70s, around 1978, he would be working in Houston, Texas. So now you might be starting to understand why I called him a Rolling Stone. I mean, this guy gets around, which brings us back to present date, 1981, where he drove off into the sunset with Denise Bowden and her six-month-old daughter, Dawn. At this point, it's safe to say that Dawn Bowden and Bob Evans wouldn't work out because by 1984, he would pop up inside of California, where again, he would be working as an electrician. But Dawn Bowden and her mother, Denise Bowden, were nowhere to be seen. But there is one funny detail about this store, because while living in Los Alamitos, California, Bob Evans would change his name to Curtis Kimball. Now, back in the 70s and 80s, it really wasn't that uncommon to be changing your name. It wasn't that easy to track you. Technology wasn't that up to date. Even if you got caught by the police, you were fingerprinted and logged in their area. But there was no database to look you up. So back then, a lot of people would just change their name. That way they don't bring their criminal history to their new employer. Most of the things back then were done on the honor system. You filled out the application and they took you at your word that you are who you say you are. But nonetheless, now going by the name of Curtis Kimball, he would continue to live his life. But Denise and Don Bowden were still missing. Where were they? They wouldn't just disappear off the face of the earth. Time begins to elapse. Denise's father Armand slowly begins to accept the fact she's not coming back. And rooted deeply inside the mystery of them vanishing would be the key that would unlock every door to every answer. But before that can happen, you must answer the question, where is Denise Bowden and her six-month-old daughter, Dawn Bowden? Everyone has that one place that they like to escape to, even if it's only in your mind, a place of tranquility. I would imagine that Allenstown would be one of those places where you move to, where you don't want to be alone, but necessarily don't want to be bothered either. It's a small community. In the year of 1985, a few Allenstown residents that were children were playing in the woods. As 10-year-old children, they had no idea what they almost uncovered. They would stand directly in front of the very thing that would change the world, literally. It would be the root cause of scientific evolution when dealing with crime scenes. But for now, they're just children who just so happen to stumble upon these. Jesse Morgan and his friends absolutely loved to play hide and seek in the woods. All of the children would hide while one of them would ride around on a four wheeler and try to find them. So it's summer, 1985. The kids are out playing in the woods, having the time of their life. Woo, summer break. When they stumble across something unusual. 
the discovery of 55 gallon drum. Now, the boys got curious and decided to check it out. While observing this 55 gallon drum, the boys would decide to try and pry it open. Once open, they would be hit with a very rancid smell. They would then decide to knock the barrel over. Once knocked over, a white fluid would escape the 55 gallon drum. With the boys being young, they would describe this as being similar to spoiled milk. After this occurred, the boys would just go back to playing as normal, and they would leave the barrel there. And for months, the barrel remained right there, just as the boys had left it. Until November 1985, when a hunter happened across the very same barrel. He also decided to take a closer look. But this time, after exploring it for just a few moments, he realized that the contents of the barrel appeared to be human remains. Once he was able to process what he had just found, he contacted police and he was pretty quickly joined in the woods by an Officer Ron Montplacier Jr. Officer Ron makes his way over to see for himself what's really inside this barrel. When he opened the plastic bag that had kind of slumped out of the barrel, the first thing that he saw was a human skull just looking right at him. That was all the information he needed. State police, as well as the attorney general, were then notified and a full-blown investigation began. Inside the barrel was not one, but two separate bodies. One of an adult female in her early 20s to early 30s, and one of a female child between the ages of 8 and 10. Both victims' cause of death would soon be revealed to be blunt force trauma to the head. Other than that, unfortunately, there was nothing immediately identifiable about who were the two victims found inside of the barrels? Questions that no one could answer. Who were they? Where were they from? What are their names? News quickly spread about the barrels in Allenstown. When this happened, it had people looking at each other as if they were suspects. After all, in a small town like this, it could be anyone. Your neighbor, your mailman, the local grocery store clerk. By now, I'm pretty sure that you thought that maybe the bodies belonged to Denise Bowden and Don Bowden, but that wasn't the case in this situation. The bodies inside of the barrels were complete mysteries without any type of forensic evidence no witnesses no names no background information the case quickly went cold and for a long time they didn't even have any suspects that is until a turn of events happened something promising seemed to come along meet allenstown resident robert steffens and let's just say that he prefers his mates to be young, very young at that. Well, a tip come through that around the time that the barrels were discovered, he was seen in his yard doing some suspicious things. When word got to circulating around that maybe he was a person of interest, he relayed the message to the people that if the police come here, I'm shooting. Vowing to retaliate in violence, this makes him look very promising makes him look a little bit more than a suspect if you're willing to die rather than take your punishment for the crime committed. It's no secret that when a crime is committed involving a child, they're going to go find the people who prefer them. But guess what? It wasn't him. In fact, he had nothing to do with this. It was impossible. He wasn't even around. After Robert Steffens was declared innocent, Back into the cold case box, all of the evidence went, and it would stay cold, with no chance of thawing soon. It was a true mystery. The only thing available were composite sketches made, trying to determine what the victims would actually look like. Just black and white photos, with eyes staring at you, begging you, pleading with you to help identify them, but no one could. Officer Ron would describe this as haunting. 
It's the one case that always stuck with him. Not being able to solve the mystery in the barrels would do something to you, especially when you're responsible for protecting them. If you're a homicide detective, they are your responsibility. And not being able to name them was tearing him up on the inside. So there, Officer Ron would wait in agony as nothing came through. No tips, no suspects, the case is completely frozen. But in due time, there will be answers. But for now, we'll get back to Curtis Kimball. At this time, he was still living inside of California. It's 1986. He's staying in Santa Cruz County. It's one of those mobile home communities, you know, where the majority of the people are retired. During his stay inside of Santa Cruz, California, he wasn't going by the name of Curtis Kimball anymore. He was now going by the name of Gordon Jensen. Yes, once again, he has changed his name. The mobile home park that he was staying in was called Holiday Host RV Park. It was located in Scotts Valley. While there, he would be performing odd jobs, but mainly just doing maintenance for the mobile home park. Well, Gordon Jensen wasn't alone. He had a five-year-old daughter with him. Her name was Lisa. So, with him going by his new alias of Gordon Jensen, it's just him and his daughter Lisa alone. Well, this catches the eye of the neighbors. The neighbors' names are the Deckers. But what they noticed was how frail Lisa was. She was always dirty. She was always sick. But at this time, Gordon Jensen had an answer for everything. He was basically telling the Deckers how he was a single father. He was barely making it. Hardly had any money. So in return, they began to help him out. They would begin to watch Lisa for him while he performed. Work. The Deckers would become very fond of Lisa, even offering to take Lisa off of Gordon Jensen's hand. They said that they had a daughter that was looking for a child. It would be a perfect match. Shortly after this was offered, Gordon Jensen disappears. But guess what? He leaves Lisa behind. You would think that this would actually make the Deckers happy because now they can keep Lisa. Only they can't keep her legally. Without the proper paperwork and credentials, she must be turned over to the state. So basically, Gordon Jensen has fled, left Lisa, and he's riding off into the sunset again. When he disappeared, no one in the mobile home park knew anything about him. So it's just as if a ghost vanished. But instead of just giving up, the detective signed to the case would put some real work in. Detective Cliff Harris, that is. So the detective began searching around the RV park for anything that could potentially be evidence. Incredibly, he was able to retrieve eight pristine fingerprints off of a piece of electrical equipment Gordon had installed while working at the RV park. The fingerprints were ran and they came back as a match to a man named Curtis Kimball. His fingerprints were on file from a drunk driving incident in 1985 for which he'd been paroled and subsequently absconded. It took two years to to finally track this man down. He was arrested for driving a stolen car in 1988, and when he was taken in for questioning, he gave investigators the name Gerald Mockerman, for which he had a matching date of birth and social security number. But when they fingerprinted him, his prints came back as a match, to Curtis Kimball. Police took the opportunity at hand and charged him with child abandonment, for which he actually served one year in prison before being released on parole in 1990. The day he was released on parole, he fled. The year's now 1990. He's been released on parole and he'll once again flee. He will be pulled over again in 1998 in California, but this time he'll be going by the alias of William Vanner. Yes, he has once again changed his name. But the thing about this guy is, you need to realize that he also had matching social security numbers. So with the right paperwork, you can be whoever you want to be. So it's 1998 and he once again rides off into the sunset. Back in the state of New Hampshire in Allenstown, the mystery of the barrel is still a mystery. It's still a cold case. No new findings. That is until a turn of events. Little did anyone know, shit was about to get even, even weirder. weirder. Even. 
The year is now May of 2000. Denise and Don Bowden still haven't been found. The barrel that was found in the woods in 1985 is still a cold case. No new information, no new leads. It seems as everything has just been tucked away in a little box and there it will remain, but not forever because something would be uncovered. Something that would take this case in a totally different direction. A state trooper named John Cody began looking into the Allenstown case and starting at square one, attempted to work his way through. He re-examined the barrel and when that didn't really yield anything new, he decided that the best course of action would be to head out to Bear Brook State Park and kind of take a look around the area where the barrel had initially been discovered because let's be honest, he really didn't have anything else to go off of. So he goes out, he's surveying the area, getting a lay of the land, looking for anything he can find that police may have missed. Anything that might point him in a direction that has yet to be explored. So he's looking around when he notices an unnatural hump in the terrain. But that hump in the terrain turned out to be two more bodies. Two sets of skeletons were found. Now on top of the barrel found in 1985 with two bodies inside of it, they now have two more in the year of 2000, bringing the total to four. The barrel appeared identical to the first, right down to the fact that it also contained the skeletal remains of two female victims, one of which was between the ages of one and three, and one that was between the ages of two and four. Now, I have some thoughts. Mainly, how in the hell did y'all miss that second barrel the first time? If this one single man saw it on his first trip, out into the woods. You're telling me that the waves of cops that had already been through there never so much as looked in that general direction? Not one single person was like, hmm, maybe we should fan out, see if there's anything else worth looking into. They claim that it was outside the proximity of the initial like crime scene, but um, it was a hundred yards away, 300 feet, 0 0.05 miles. It takes on average 20 minutes to walk a mile. 5% of 20 is one. It was a one minute walk from the first barrel. How is that outside the proximity of the crime scene? You're telling me that an outdoor crime scene is not at least one minute in any general direction? That shit just blows my mind. Now the total is four. Four unknown human beings. Four human beings found inside of a barrel. They didn't have any evidence the first time, and they most certainly didn't have any this time. It will remain a cold case. Despite efforts to once again track down the victims, it was a failure. And now it's looking like no one will ever solve this mystery. At this point, there are so many unanswered questions. Where is Denise Bowden and her daughter? Who are the four victims? No one can answer these questions, but with time, wounds heal, and also with time, things are revealed. While the victims lay resting, the man of many names was still living his life, in California that is. In fact, it was Richmond, California. He had recently met a new girl. Her name was Unsoon Jun, a chemist who worked at a biotech company near Richmond. Unsoon Jun was described as a free spirit as well, but she was also described as lonely. Often doing pottery in her makeshift lab in the garage, she had no male companionship, just a couple of friends and family. Well, one day Unsoon Jun runs into Larry Vanner, once again working as a handyman. You know that skilled trade he has that helps him get around so damn good. But nonetheless, Unsoon Jun felt like she had met the love of her life. Even her family loved this man. Her family hated this man. They thought he was creepy and rude. Not to mention, they began to notice that the more time she spent with him, the more withdrawn she became from them. Basically, red flags were just sprouting up all over the place when it came to this man. But Unsoon didn't see them and the relationship carried on. Yes, it does. It has everything to do with it. It has everything to do with you to sit here and practice. Look at me when I talk to you. You have everything for you to do with you sitting there and tell me. You have everything for you to do is sit there and tell me I'm not good enough for you. I'm not good enough for you. I'm not good enough for you.
while dating Larry Vanner, Hoon Soon Joon would be described as very distant, not acting herself. In fact, her family would explain this as a trans. But then there came a time when the family nor friends could get in touch with Hoon Soon Joon, and it was starting to look a little suspicious. That is when Hoon Soon Joon's friend stepped in. Renee Rose would call multiple times trying to get in contact with Eun Soon Joon. However, Larry Vanner always has an excuse as to why she cannot speak with her. Hello? Hello, may I speak to Eun Soon? No, you can't. Why not? Well, she's busy taking care of her mother right now. Call back later. What? I would like to speak to Eun Soon. Well, quite frankly, she doesn't want to be friends with you anymore. She says she no longer likes you. You're nothing but a pest. She doesn't want you calling here anymore. So I think that would be the best idea. Leave us alone. Unsoon's friend, Renee Rose, told him that if she hadn't heard from Unsoon by the time she returned home from vacation in 10 days, she was going to call the police and formally report her missing. And when she returned home and saw that she did not have a message waiting from Unsoon, she did just that. Basically, don't mess with Renee. Roxanne Grunheide, a detective for the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office, received the call. The missing persons investigation kicked off fairly traditionally by questioning the partner. Unsoon's boyfriend, Larry Vanner. Detective Grunheide described him as polite and soft-spoken, noting that he could very easily seem trustworthy. However, what he wasn't was cooperative. He spent the interview deflecting questions and telling stories to waste time, and he barely ever even mentioned Unsoon. Yesterday morning I had some things to attend to, but I did call you, I thought, in a reasonable time. You did? And at that time you said, uh, that you'd give me a little bit of leeway for a couple of days until I could get my ducks lined up, or whatever term you prefer to use. And that's true. So what I was doing was making arrangements to get my ducks lined up. Okay. And now you've got me up here. Okay. So here I am. Now, okay, okay, we've been through this road already. Okay. Everybody is different. Right. Uh, law enforcement people are human beings like everybody else like every other individual. Now, I haven't talked any more about Ensoon's problems or my problems, because frankly, you're not my priest, no. and you're not my doctor, and both stories have their place. You know, gossip has its place in society sometimes, but I'm just not gonna say any more about Ensoon or myself right now, oh. because, with the understanding of I mean, the law. frankly, no, I'm not, I'm not going to cut you off. Hmm? I'm not going to cut you off. And I've always tried to live by the model that there's no defense against the truth. But sometimes it's hard to find out what the truth is. You got one side, the other side, and something down the middle that people might perceive to be the truth. Where is Eun Soon Joon? A question that will be answered on the next part. This will conclude part one. Make sure you subscribe so you can stay updated for when part two comes out. The questions still remain. Where are Denise Bowden and her daughter, Dawn Bowden? Who were the victims inside of the barrel? Where is Eun Soon Joon? All of this will be answered and more. I took the liberty of doing extensive research and I also uncovered some facts that will be mind blown. This story is far from over. In fact, I've only told half of it. And with the remaining information, you will want to go do research on your own once you learn what's available. This is the story of the family man.